Good morning uh, and welcome to the keynote morning session of day three of the NHS Project Futures Festival 21. Um, so for those of you that are new into the uh, festival for this session, um, uh, I'm Jo Stanford. I'm head of the Portfolio Office for Health Education England and head of Project Profession. Uh, and I'm leading this session today. Just before I hand you over to Professor Eddie Obeng, our keynote spe speaker this morning, I just let you know the format of the virtual festival. Sorry for those that have been doing it for three days now, um, I'll be quick. So you'll see on the right hand side of the screen, there is a panel which uh, includes chat, Q&A and notes. The chat is self-explanatory, you can make comments and respond to what others have said. As a starting point, say hello, let everybody know that you're here and uh, then chat to each other as we go through the session. Um, a game code uh, was given very briefly at the beginning of the session for participants when they arrive. If you write that down in the notes tab on the right hand side of the screen, uh, after the session, you can input the code into the festival game page and add the awarded points to your total. And there's fierce competition going on, so uh, you don't want to miss out. Uh, we also give a game code at the conclusion of the session for those that stay to the end. If you have any difficulties any time, you can check the info tab quick guide on the left hand side uh, 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 sidebar. And there's also a uh, help desk moderator. So if you click on the help desk, send a message. Uh, we've got a couple of people hanging out looking to sort out any issues. So for Q&A, uh, we're going to be doing some polls throughout the uh, session. There's also going to be a brief breakout uh, session. So you'll find the links to that uh, in the description below. So have that ready to go. Um, and uh, this is really interactive and we really want you to engage and think and chat. So, um, so get your thinking uh, brains on. And um, at the time of Q&A, we will... Um, uh, at the end of the session, if you post your questions, I'll ask them for Eddie and um, we'll, we'll find out more about what he thinks. So, and now without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce you to Professor Eddie Obang. Um, Eddie is uh, the creator of uh, Pentacle, the virtual business school, and he's also a, a lecturer and uh, has an amazing TED talk. So if you've not seen that yet, check it out in the description links. It's fantastic. Um, and in this interactive session, um, he's going to uh, discover and talk about the future of work and the role of projects in it. And he'll help you reassess the skills, thinking and talent you need to keep energy and motivated as you nav navigate the post-COVID world. So that's more or less what we all need right now. So welcome, Eddie, and thank you for joining us. Great. Yes, I will. Hi. Hi, everyone. Really, really good to see you. And I I'm delighted to be here. Um, so Joe's introduced me and um, uh, I'm not going to say much more about myself because these days we have this thing called the internet and you can cyber stalk me and find out all you need to know about me. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about what I'm planning to do together with us, uh, with you today. So um, I think the session is about the future of work. Am I in the right place? <laughs> You're all worried already. Okay, so let's have a look at what the, uh, the outline is going to look like. So I'm going to run the session really by breaking it into different chapters. Um, so I have a first chapter, which I'm calling the structure of the U universe, or I'll do it with my, uh, my good voice, the structure of the universe. Okay. And then the second chapter, which we go through is going to be called back to BC. Um, BC, of course, being before COVID. The third chapter is going to be about people, projects, and performance. Then we'll have a breakout where you have a task you've got to do. And then we're going to move on to what I call the shortest journey. How do we get from where we are to where you would love to be? Uh, and then finishing off with um, my future of work. And I'm going to tell you about my future of work. Um, so Joe explained that I, I teach and I write and I started Pentacle, the virtual business school. But what happened was about 25 years ago, I got involved in trying to research what was happening with projects. And out of that, I wrote a book called All Change, which you may have come across, which was basically something which made people rethink projects. Because 25 years ago, projects were boring things. You know, basically, if your career was stalled and the management wanted to get rid of you, then they gave you a special project and you were never seen again. And I wrote All Change to try and humanize projects and look at the soft side. Um, but what that led to also is me starting to think about how could I live in the future. So I will share with you my future of work, what I've been doing for the past 20 years, um, and put that into context for you. So that's my plan. Uh, and I'm sort of going to 
hopefully just walk you through it uh, one step at a time. But of course, I made this plan before I met you. You know, like a typical agenda, it's probably not quite right. It's probably not spot on. It's probably gone past its sell by date. So I'm going to try something with you. I'm going to try rhetorically trying to say what I think you want from the session. Should we try that? Is that okay? Okay. So what I've got here is I've got what I think might be your greatest hopes and your greatest fears for this session we're in. So I'm assuming that you're probably looking for complex, way, simple ways to understand the complex world. Is that right? If I say, do you agree, will they launch the poll and then I'll be in trouble? Okay, why not? Okay, I'm assuming that you're looking for some energy and positivity in this post-COVID world. I'm assuming that you're probably working out in your mind, how should I think differently in this world so I'm successful and happy? How should I feel differently so I can help my patients, customers, colleagues? How should I behave differently so I can get better results? Uh, and how should I act differently so that the options and actions I take really make a difference. Am I roughly correct? You're allowed to nod, uh, shake your head, or more importantly, launch the poll. Do you agree? <laughs> the poll didn't launch. I didn't think it did. Anyway, so those are what I think our hopes are. <laughs> now, if I was wrong, I'm in trouble. But I also want to contemplate your fears. I think that secretly you're worried that the session will be the same old, same old stuff. I suspect you're worried that it'll just be motherhood, uh, $8 bingo. You know what $8 bingo is, and so a yakety yak. I'm assuming you're going to, thinking that you'll have nothing positive to take away. So I suspect these are your fears. And so what I'm going to do to avoid the same old, same old is I'm going to do my best to tell you new stuff. And if I'm telling you stuff that you already know, put it in the chat and then Joe can correct me and realign me, okay? I'm going to try and avoid motherhood. I'll try and just tell you real things, real stories. And I'm going to give you concrete things to take away. So by doing those three things, hopefully your fears won't come true. What I've just done there is I've shared with you how I usually start any engagement, any project. It's a method called hopes and fears. You see, when people come together in a fast-changing world, they all have in their minds what they're worried about is going to happen, what their objectives are. And in most meetings, the leader just starts and says, right, the objective of this is, and they go into what we call output mode. They talk at you, and you're going, well, I'm worried about yakety yak. And so you can't contribute 100%. Do you know anyone who wakes up and works with passion on something which they think isn't going to work, where they have great fears? Never happens. So one of the things you do early on to engage people, to bring them in, is you find out what their goals are aligned with my agenda, which I produced. And you also look at the things they're going to be worried about. And then, and most importantly of all, having framed it, you then make sure that you've done something to get rid of their fears. Then they relax, then we can all participate. See, I wrote here in the orange ones, your fears, but I've got some fears as well. Can I share them with you? Is that okay? Okay, so my fears, my biggest fear of all is the fear of zombies. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now you're probably thinking that's a bit strange, you know, but the reality is old world zombies, they weren't that scary. They sort of walked around like this, and, uh, okay, very slowly. You can run away from them. Okay. Modern zombies, they don't walk like that. They have their little devices and they swoosh and they swipe and they do this thing called multitasking. Uh, it's like zombie uh, singing, but it's not quite, if you see what I mean. And therefore they're never really present. They're sort of half, they're half in, half out. And they have lots of experiences, but when they're old and gray, they won't remember any of them because they're all jumbled up. So please, just for this session, please don't be a zombie. I'm also terrified you won't take any notes. Um, I am a professor. This is a serious session. I know I'll be making jokes, but please take notes. And especially when I make drawings, copy the drawings on a piece of paper because then you'll get the physical mental memory uh, as well. So that's a really important thing. Uh, and then I'm worried also that there will be no questions added to the, um, the chat. So Joe, I don't know whether anything's coming up. And also I'm going to suggest exercises, like I'm going to suggest you have a think about how you might apply hopes and fears. And I would like it if you didn't ignore that. So that's where I've got to. I'm going to stop for a second. Joe, is there anything in the chat I need to move to before I start? Chapter one. <clears throat> Hi, Eddie. Um, so just uh, looking at the chat so far, everybody's really um, sort of interested. Emma said uh, that she's not worried, uh, Eddie. She's seen your TED talk. She knows what's, uh, what's involved. That's great. Um, and if we can uh, have people filled in the poll uh, and sort of said, do you agree with Eddie's hopes and fears? 
Um, is this what, what's, uh, you know, challenging people's minds at the moment? Um, if we can go to that. And uh, yeah, if, if we can get questions in as we go, that's great. Uh, but also keep the comments coming into the chat. Robert May says, um, yes, you're absolutely right, Eddie. Um, these are the things. So um, keep, keep getting into the chat and I will come back and fill you in. So uh, let, me know, let, let me know what you all think and uh, I'll feed that back to Eddie as we, as we go through the session. Okay, that's wonderful. So, so wow. How's that in terms of a poll? 100% agree. Poll. Okay, so what, what um, I think is quite crucial also is that we should, um, let's just think. I'll tell you a story. I did a, I'm a bit strange um, uh, because I, I don't always get things straight away. I'm not always 100% where people are. I did a conference on the future of work for Gartner. Gartner, a huge global uh, organization who spend their time talking about technology and stuff like that. And I was asked to speak at this conference and before me, there was a futurist. And um, the futurist um, basically was on, he was talking about the future of work and he was describing, he came on with these lovely slides, you know, futurists they have beautiful slides. And he said, well, like, talking about the future of work, what's gonna happen is, imagine this, you'll wake up in the morning, what will happen is your computer knows when it should wake you up because it can see the traffic movements and understands what people are going to be doing and so forth and so forth. So he said, it'll wake you up extra early in the morning and having woken up, uh, by the time you get to your fridge, your fridge will have pre-ordered the eggs you really like and uh, then your, your grid will be working and there'll be a little robotic thing zipping around. And so, the, and then as you're leaving the house, it describes how the, 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 the trains know who's coming because of your phones. So they put on extra carriages and then you get into your carriage and he's describing all these beautiful photographs. And he was looking at, ooh, wonderful. And he's describing how you go, you go through on the train and you're already connected and inter and you understand what your day is going to be looking like. And you're interfacing with your PDA, who's actually a, an AI bot. And he's describing all these things. And then he goes through and you arrive at the office and the office have worked out the temperature because he knows how many people are coming, how much air, CO2. Wow, amazing. And then he goes on and everyone's nodding. And then he finishes off by going, and then you go to your meeting. And I burst out laughing. And there were about a thousand people there. And that was me laughing. Ha, 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 ha. Because it's too, and then I realized I was the only one laughing. <laughs> you see, to me, it seemed a bit crazy that he'd done all this stuff just to allow you to continue to behave and do what we've been doing for hundreds of years. It just seemed really weird. So I laughed and no one else laughed. Um, and, um, and I realized maybe I was slightly out of sync. So let me share this with you. This is um, how the work has evolved just over the past, I don't know, a couple of hundred years. I'm gonna share with you some thoughts and just a, a view before we understand the future, uh, the way the universe works. This is a picture of miners. Miners are crucial because some of us still describe the workplace as the coal face. Have you come across that? Um, I would launch the poll, but it takes forever. Okay, so not if, yeah, yeah, I can see you nodding. Okay, so miners, they used to commute. They used to uh, walk on their knees for about one to two to three miles in order to get to the coal face, which was lovely if there was no one there. But when people were there, it was really noisy and gritty and horrible. Okay, and that was sort of early commuting, future of work type stuff. But the whole journey has been a bit longer than that. So once they started to industrialize um, farming, you see everyone standing in a nice neat line, um, which is great. Uh, and um, and the, the horse doing all the hard work, but they've got a process. Then they moved us to other straight lines. So here you go, people, uh, uh, goods in on the left, finished goods on the right, moving along, nice processes, fantastic. Okay, and then we moved to the next stage of the process where they took us out of the factories, put us into offices, but still in straight lines. <laughs> Inbox, outbox, same idea, not a single new concept, okay? Uh, and, uh, and so here we are working. And then they came up with the concept of, let's give them computers. So now we've got phones, computers, IBMs, and so on. So start connecting to the internet. Uh, they have the desks. And then the first innovation comes along. Instead of having us in straight lines, they put us through 90 degrees <laughs> into little cubicles, okay? And, uh, and then we move on from there because now we've got the internet. So all of a sudden, people can scare away from their desks. You can see these guys over here playing the pianos. I don't know if you can see the chap in the corner just hiding over there, trying to do some work on his laptop while everyone else is playing. Um, but, but we suddenly untethered ourselves from our desks 
And then we went, well, we can work anywhere. So this guy here, he didn't get the memo. He was told that uh, mobile, digital is mobile and so on and so forth. But he didn't really understand what they meant. Okay, so we still untethered ourselves. We decided we could work anywhere. I don't know whether any of you have tried to do some really complex work in a noisy cafe or not. It's not a good plan. They also made us carry around devices with these very small screens to make them light. The reality is the smaller the screen, the harder it is to work. I did an experiment once when I was writing a book. I bought a very small computer with a seven inch screen because I thought I'd write the book as I went along. Couldn't write a thing. It's too small. You can consume, but it's very hard to create. Anyway, moving on. So we started doing this, these things and they weren't working for us. It was noisy, we were distracted. So then we started creating things like, you must have a quiet room. You must have somewhere to work on your own. And then um, once that fashion had come in, people went, yes, we need time. We need mindfulness and so on and so forth. Um, and then they started talking about things like, well, why can't we just do what we did before? Why can't we just create a digital version of what we're doing? Okay. And here's a picture of uh, one of our clients came along. They said, we run design thinking workshops. Can you do the same? So uh, with my team on Cube, we built them a room and we said to them, you really don't want to reproduce what you do in real life. They said, yes, we do. Yes, we do. We are, no, no, you don't. You want something slightly different. Anyway, so we built it for them. And we used it eventually for something else because they discovered that wasn't the right thing. Now, this one is an interesting one. This is the Apple headquarters. So what's happened is we've gone from straight lines to 90 degrees. Now we're into circles. But the mindset's all still the same. One of my friends is a senior, senior, senior executive. And I won't mention his name at Apple because I'll get him into trouble. Even in lockdown, even in these times, they're trying to get people to go to the office. They don't want people working from home. Why? If you had spent three billion on building an office, would you want people working from home? So we have one of the world's leading big tech companies trying to drive them back to the days before we had digital. Isn't that weird? So, so that's the starting point in terms of understanding the future of work. So let's look at the structure of the universe. Joe, just a quick question. Uh, anything you want me to ask, uh, answer before we go and start understanding how we can get back control of our lives? And um, we haven't got any, any questions yet. I think everybody's just absorbing the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of the history and the way we are now. Uh, but I love the... Um, uh, the, the movements and it'd be interesting to see what comes after um, squares and corners and circles and sort of saying well, actually, <laughs> what fantastic. comes next. Fantastic. Guys, you have to put stuff in the chat. If you don't interact, you'll forget. Honestly, unless you're less than 18 years old, this will just pass through your mind and evaporate. Okay. So let's have a go at understanding <clears throat> the structure of the universe. Okay. So, um, I don't know whether you realize this, but the world is a very strange place. Um, quite simply, uh, best story I can think of to tell you to start off with is, uh, I'll just draw a tree. There you go, a tree with some sort of branchy thingies, things down here. Does that look like, that looks tree-like, okay? Um, and I'm going to put an apple on the tree. So I'll just put a little apple here. And did you know that once upon a time, people didn't know that if an apple fell and it, it would go down and land on your head? They, they just they hadn't worked that out, you know. I don't know what they thought, but they obviously thought something, okay. And then there's this chap with a funny wig, okay. And the apple fell on his his head, and he suddenly went, "Ha! Huh, gravity!" Have you come across this before? And once he'd figured that there was this gravity thing, they started noticing that there were all these laws of physics, like. Hot things tend to go to becoming cold things. Uh, like I don't know, when you push something, if you stop pushing it, it stops. Okay. For example, they didn't realize that uh, it, they were scared when trains started that if the train went too fast, you wouldn't get any oxygen. <laughs> but then they realized, of course, with these laws, that the oxygen is moving at the same speed as a train. You know, etc. So by understanding the laws, they simplified the world to the point where we can talk together electronically today because they understood the laws of how the world works. Turns out that there are also laws to do with change. And in this complex post-COVID world, if you understand those laws, you can really relax because it always does the same thing. You'll notice that there's more and more um, uh, in terms of uh, I'll call them fashions, that's not the right word, movements, you know, with change, with projects, with agile, with nimble, with uh, inclusion, with this, with that. There's hundreds of movements. And if you were to list all the things people think are important, neuroscience, this, that, the other, through the week, you've got a lot to do. 
So I'm going to just try and pull some of those threads together. And then as we go, I'll try and explain how the week fits together around those threads. The first most important rule to remember is really simple. And you might have seen this on the internet where they have like a domino and then a bigger domino. If you haven't seen this, go and look for the video because it's absolutely amazing. And they have a whole series of dominoes like that, okay? And then what happens is somebody pushes the first domino. Have you seen this one? So that goes clunk and hits the second one. Clunk, that one hits that one. Clunk, that one hits that one. And then it falls, clunk, okay? And this basically is the first law of change. The first law of change basically says one change leads to another, okay? This is really crucial because sometimes people act and they don't realize that there'll be implications to their acts. So it means many things. If you're going to take some an action, check where it's going to lead. Make sure it's the minimum most important one. Make sure it doesn't have downsides which you weren't anticipating. All of those elements are crucial because of the second law of change. The second law of change, if you watch my TED talk, you'll, you'll have come across that. But basically, have you noticed how when you're doing something in a project and one thing changes and then somebody adds something else and then the meeting gets moved, all of a sudden it just goes chaotic. Have you noticed that? And the, in the TED talk, I talk about it in terms of uh, an experiment I did when I was a young uh, researcher, which basically had water flowing down a pipe, a bit of green ink coming into the pipe and a nice little trickle until, of course, you turn up the water so that there's so much water that it all goes away and it suddenly it becomes a wonderful sort of uh, mixed up uh, system, which is what's called turbulence. Turbulence is what engineers call chaos. OK, so the second law is adding change to change creates chaos. That's why when you plan your projects, you don't link them completely. Any organization where they have a PMO which butts up projects to each other, they don't deliver anything. You loosely couple them so that if one thing goes wrong, it doesn't knock on everything else. When you're right planning your diary, you put holes in your diary. What's a hole? A hole is a half hour here, a half hour there, where you have no meetings. Why? Because you know everything's going to overrun. Unless you have holes in every day, and you'll arrive home at the end of the day, or rather you'll stay at home at the end of the day, and think back through the day of chaos where you have achieved nothing you set out to do. So that's the second uh, law. The third one, and this, guys, is where you come in. The reality is, when things change because, I don't know, bricks fall over or mountains erode, those are the laws of physics. But in the world we live in, we are the crucial elements. Why? Because people have two different jobs. The first job they do is you would have noticed that, to a large extent, and put a little smiley face on here, to a large extent, people create change. Have you noticed how whenever you have your own idea, you want it to happen, and you sort of push for that idea? So I've got this person sort of actively pushing some idea like that, okay? And have you noticed that sometimes when you push, you come across what might be described as a brick wall? Have you come across that, as a brick wall? <laughs> Often, the brick wall isn't actually a brick wall at all. It's just another person <laughs> because people create change and they constrain it. So one of the things we're going to have to learn is how do you engage people? How do you collaborate? How do you get them to buy in? How do you get them to engage? They create change if they initiate it. They constrain it if it comes and surprises them. I'll explain the science behind that as well. And you've talked a little bit about this this week as well when you were talking about the neuroscience engagement, when Navina kicked us off in terms of how should we work together and how are we going to create this together. The fourth law um, is, is another one which is really crucial. And this one you see all through the world, um, but it's the way we can move to a successful life in this post-COVID world. Um, I'll tell you a story. I don't know whether you know, but in the olden days, those strange people, obviously not our ancestors, were far smarter. They would watch the sun and this little golden orb would sort of start in the morning and it would go wee across to the other side of the earth, okay? And they came to the conclusion that the sun goes round the earth. Do you remember that, okay? And then somebody went, no, 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 that's not quite right. They figured out that actually it was the wrong way around. So here was the sun, and actually, the Earth went round the sun, okay? And when you talk to people, they go, well, that's obvious. But it's not true. 
the two things look exactly the same. How would it look different if the earth went round the sun or the sun went round the world? It would still look exactly the same. The other bit which I've, add, I've not added is, of course, the reason you have a day isn't because the earth goes round the sun. Yes, that would give you a 365-day day, but it's because the thing is rotating. So there are three different things which would all look exactly the same. This is why you must never, ever, ever take your own opinions too seriously. Never. Anything you believe is probably wrong, okay? It might be right, but even if it's correct, something might change in the world and your really brilliant opinion becomes obsolete and gibberish. So that's why learning is so important. And that leads us to the last point. The laws of change work like this. When you've got something which is working well, guess what you do? You do more of it. So the moment you understand stuff, the moment you can scale stuff, you start to do what we call order. And so basically what happens is you have like a land of order. I should have probably put a blue, blue edge for the sea over here. That's your land of order. We know how to do things. We do more of them. Everything grows, more, 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 et cetera. Okay. We know how to make sure the patients and we can do lots of injections. Okay, great. As long as you're in the land of order, you're just heading towards a, a point because you're not going to ever get out of it. If you're lucky, then some chaos comes along. You say, if you're lucky, Eddie, are you nuts? Yes, if you're lucky, chaos comes along. And the chaos has got red, spiky, dangerous things in it. And so you don't want to go to the chaos. That's why people avoid doing new stuff. They don't want to fail. They don't want the pain, okay? But if you can make it through this spiky stuff, okay, what you discover is that there is actually sort of a, another land up here. I'm going to make it like a floating island, which has got lots of gold on it. Why? The way the world works, and it has always been this, is there's order, the Roman Empire. It collapses. Out of the collapses comes the next empire. There's a different way of doing things. Out of that comes the next one. So out of, I don't know, uh, uh, the growth of uh, uh, large corporations who run steam engines. When they collapse, we've got cars. When we cars collapse, we've got internet. So things come out from the chaos, from the disruption. But we really don't want the disruption. But this gold, it's not just lying there. The next thing you have to realize is that, you know, in kids' stories, it's always the same. The gold is where? The gold is always underneath the dragon, okay? So just because you've made it through the chaos doesn't mean that everything's going to be great. So this is the nature of the world. Things are great. Then a horrid little red thing comes along and it brings lots and lots and lots of clouds. And we go, oh, it's horrible, horrible. And yes, it's very miserable and it puts us under pressure. And some people have not been very well and we've lost lives. But chaos is a feature of reality. Now we have two options. One is to go into the chaos, work our way through, and then get to that floating island and get the gold. And the other one is to sit where we are. The only way you make the transition from here to there is by learning new stuff and by transforming. So sometimes I'll describe this as, this is caterpillar land, caterpillar, lots of legs. This is butterfly land, butterflies fly, no overlapping competences. Caterpillars walk, they have lots of legs. Butterflies look lovely and fly. The way we get there is through the learning, through the cocoon, through the experimentation. And remember, a caterpillar can never explain anything about flight. They have no clue. So the journey you have to take to the future of work is going to take you to areas where you have no idea what's going on and you're going to discover them as you go. Stopping there at the end of chapter one on understanding the nature of the universe. Joe, are there questions, are there comments? Hi Eddie, yes there are. Um, you've really energized people and uh, the first question is where do you get it from? Because everybody wants some of your energy. <laughs> okay, so things you should do and uh, things I try to do. Um, try to only do things which make you happy. It's just really easier that way. Okay. Um, uh, try stay fit. So try to do something which gets you out of breath every day. That's also very useful. If you can meditate, meditation is not complicated. You sit somewhere comfortable, breathe as if the air is going, not through your nose, but straight into your heart, in for five when you're learning, out for five, and then eventually for 10. Just do that, and all of a sudden, a lot of issues start to realign themselves. 
Um, the other thing I've also realized, which makes me much happier, and we'll talk about this, is that if you generally go where your biggest fear is, the fear goes away quicker. And therefore, you, you've got more energy to deal with things. Whereas if you hide from it, it just nibbles away at all your energy. <laughs> I think that's the most profoundest thing I've heard so far because that that, I, that completely resonates with me that I waste a lot of energy avoiding dealing with the thing that I know is actually, you know, the thing you that needs sorting out. <laughs> yeah. You've got to know I think we could probably all relate to that one. Brilliant. Okay. Shall I so, carry on, Joe? Yeah. So in terms of questions, we've got... Um, uh, so uh, Rob's put a question in around, isn't the issue with um, sort of shifting to sort of uh, virtual w remote working uh, to do with employers wanting you to work in the office related to hierarchy, control, lack of trust? Um, and, and how do you get uh, employers focusing on output and not input? That's a great question. I mean, there's a chap called Chris Hurd, who is a great... Um, remote working evangelist. Um, and he's been doing lots and lots of research. And the reality is that apparently a third of companies don't actually intend after in the post-COVID world to send anyone back to the offices. Um, it's partly to do with saving money. It's partly to do with the fact they've realized they can work differently. It's partly to do with they've discovered which managers are managers and which ones are leaders because the manager managers really struggle when their staff aren't there under their noses to poke. Um, so, excuse me. <coughs> So it might be better than you imagine it's going to be. But there's also a challenge for a lot of us because especially younger people, home is not a workplace. You know, you don't, you didn't build your home and set it up so that you could have an office in it. That's ridiculous. So most of us actually working from home is a real pain. Um, and also it disrupts our family life and our kids and stuff like that. So we have to think about how we do that in future as well. And that actually answers another of the questions, which is sort of uh, work is home and home is work. You know, how do we adapt? Um, yeah, so that I, I'll, I won't get enough time to talk about this, but one of the secrets, uh, and it's a secret with everything, which is do stuff in the same, do the same stuff in the same places. So um, if you work at a desk, that's your work desk. Don't take your laptop and sit in front of the telly. You know, so that you, even if you're just in a one bedroom flat, you know, you might have two feet here and you say, this is where I sit where I make phone calls. This is where I sit where I text. And so by doing that, you separate the things out and it allows you to shut down. But the other thing I do is, of course, is, as, as you know, I live in a virtual world. So when you finish at the end of the day, you turn the virtual world off, it ceases to exist. And so your brain then takes in, 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 into action the, uh, the real world around you. Great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of crack on and, um, and just move to the next chapter. Okay. The next chapter is called uh, Back to BC, um, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm still I'm still sharing the black um, blackboard, aren't I? So again, just thinking about this week, we've had a fantastic week so far. But we had, um, for example, a long conversation about VUCA. Were you there for that, you guys? And talking about volatile, uncertain worlds. And I think it was um, uh, Ruth, who, Dr. Ruth, who was talking about that. So there's a lot of talk about uncertainty. Where do we go? Now, I don't know how old you guys are, but I'm a really old person. So I can remember 1990. <laughs> okay, so what used to happen is in 1990, and if we make this 2020 or 2021, it doesn't matter, um, the world still existed. Okay, it wasn't in black and white. It was still in color. I know the films make it look like it was all in black and white. But what used to happen there was that we also thought the world was changing fast, even in the 1980s. I mean, go right back in time. People have always complained about the speed of change of the world. It's not actually the speed of change of the world, which is the challenge. I'll, show, I'll explain why. See, now, of course, we have more people on the planet um, they're all connected together by the internet at the speed of light. Every organization is actively seeking change. So if you look at the pace of change in the world, it literally is doing this wonderful sort of curvy uppy thing. And this is the VUCA which everyone's talking about. That's uncertain. But that's not the challenge. The world can be uncertain. But imagine I gave you an AI bot which solved everything for you. You wouldn't care it was uncertain. The reason you care it's uncertain is because it doesn't necessarily make sense to you. In other words, if we look at how you've learned and understood and how you're changing and adapting to match, I can remember when people used to do budgets. That means they assume they can learn faster than the world is changing. Okay. And I, I've watched them and let's do it together in your organization, in your life. 
If I move the pen horizontally, tell me, we were learning faster, we're changing faster. And I'll move the pen up or I'll move it down or I'll move it horizontal. Even though I can't hear you, you can put it into the chat and I'll, I'll sort of watch it. And together, what's happened to our ability to learn and change over that time period? Action, go, we NHS festival. <laughs> Uh, so what's happened for most of us is that the pace of learning has not matched the pace of change. And we know this has happened because before we got to this point, we were already struggling with certain types of, of, of issues. And my favorite is I have a diagram. I, if I can find it fast, I'll share it with you because it's always funny. Um, because people always recognize this one from uh, the days before COVID. Because um, there's sort of like an assumption that, oh, before COVID, everything was good. No, it's not true. Uh, I think I have to stop share before I start share. Is that right, Mike? I'll probably get told off because I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to do this really slickly, but I, you know me. I'm just, okay, great. Yay. Man. Okay. So guys, do you recognize this? Okay. It starts over here where it says I have a high workload. Obviously not you guys. Nothing to do. A whole week at the festival. Okay. So I don't have time to plan to do or to be creative. So I don't realize how much work I've committed to and I've only done half. So I say yes more than is realistic, pushing my workload up, giving me less time to plan or to do or to be creative. So I come close to deadlines. Other people think I'm important. They're keen to meet their goals. So they interrupt me. So I spend a lot of my time restarting half correct dumb work, pushing my workload up, giving me less time to plan or to do it. So now people know I'm disorganized. They can send me text messages in the middle of the night. It goes round and round. Have you seen this happening to your colleagues at work? Why does it happen? Because they've got stretching, challenging targets and life is tough, but also because they're trying to do things the way they always have. And many of the things they do have very little effect. So if you recognize this, then you start to see what the challenge is. You see, even before COVID came along, we already had that gap. And then that gap got filled by the horrible little monster, which came and zapped us all. There you go. Horrible, horrible red thing. Okay. So, how do we know that was the case? Because we were already trying to do things about it. Let's take, for example, work, future of work. Future of work comes in three flavors. There's the actual work, there's the workforce, and then there's also the workplace, okay? So there's three of them all together. So what happens with that is, let's start with the workforce. Even before COVID, we knew there was something wrong. Because what used to happen was, if I put here 100%, 100%, okay, what used to happen in the old days was people would join, they'd work in a company, and then they'd retire. But you've got a generation coming through who all believe the same thing. They've all been to the Second World War. They all thought they were supposed to listen to the boss. They were all happy with hierarchies and so on. If you looked at this world here, what we do is we put the most knowledgeable person in charge. They would tell the others what to do. We'd build a hierarchy. You were in this bit here. You weren't allowed to do anything you weren't allowed to do because if you did something and got it wrong, someone else would complain. It would go all the way to the bosses. Then the lightning bolt would zap you and then you'd get into trouble. But importantly, you'd hate the person who reported you. So we got lots and lots of disconnection, not much collaboration in the organizations. But it was fine because that was the order. Remember, we're doing it. We're doing more and more and more. Then the world starts moving to this bit here. So all of a sudden, different groups of people are coming through the organization and we're changing people's assumptions and beliefs. So we've got the boomers coming through. But at the same time, we've got the next generation coming through. Then we've got the millennials. Then we've got the X's and we've got the Y's. So all of a sudden, we've got all these different generations in the workplace. So there were conversations even before COVID. How are we going to do with all these generations in the workplace? Because they're all crammed together. And then we made the world global. So people are coming from all different cultures, languages. So how are we going to deal with diversity and take advantage? All these things were in place well before COVID. Also, digital stuff was happening. I live in a town called Beaconsfield, strange town, has time travelers. That's where those are the people who live here. What used to happen was pre-COVID, they lived in houses which had like internet connections and everything else. They could FaceTime everyone in the world. But every morning they get dressed, get into a car, onto a train and drive for an hour to this place called an office. I don't know if you come across this. Now, why they were trying travelers was the house was in the 21st century, but the office was in the 20th century. It's locked down. They can't do anything. Firewalls, etc. So they would start in the 21st century and they travel to the 20th century. So you ask yourself, why did they travel to the 20th century? What are they going there to do? They went to play games. The games were, one was called email tag. I email you, you reply to me, Brian, you see that person. They then bump into that person. 20 emails later, 
We say, oh, we must get together and have a meeting to discuss it, but we're in different offices. So we have another game. This is called conference call. I don't know if you know it. But everyone dials the same number, okay? And then they pretend that it's, a, it's actually a conference, okay? Uh, my definition of a conference call is one person talking and 20 people just continuing to do their email tag. Um, and so they would do this all day. And then at the end of the day, they would commute back to the 21st century. Despite the fact that digitally, the electrons can go faster than they can, despite the fact that there's technology which can help them, and instead of allowing the technology to enable them to be more than human, to, to fulfill their dreams, they use the technology to replace them, to automate them. A bizarre, weird world, okay? Then the third thing which happened, and you'll know this as well, is that in project land, so you want to change something old world. What do you do? We've got something we want to change. Let's make a plan, okay? So always you knew exactly what you were going to do and how you were going to do it. And it was like, you know when you were kids, you'd have a little book and you could paint it in, you know, blue is, blue is one, green is two, and you color it in. And then, you remember? Okay. So we used to do what we call paint by numbers. That was how projects used to be, waterfall and stuff. It doesn't mean they were simple. It's just they were more predictable. But you will know that sometimes in the past few years, you've had projects where you know exactly what to do and no idea how to do it, not a clue. You've had projects where you know how you're going to do it because it's new technology, new methodology, no idea how it will be received. And my favorite, you've got projects where you have no clue what to do or how to do it, but you know something must be done. Do you agree? You're allowed to launch the poll. <laughs> Okay, so you have paint by numbers ones, but these ones I call a quest, like the uh, quest for the Holy Grail, where basically um, what was happening with the what, but not the how, was that um, King Arthur, if you remember that story uh, going back, he basically had worked out um, uh, uh, how he was going to make sure that, uh, sorry, what the goal was, which is get the Holy Grail, but he couldn't figure out how he was going to do it. And then these ones down here, I call these movies, because if you film something on the camera and you upload it to YouTube, nobody watches unless you have a decent script, then it goes viral. Method looking for an outcome, solution looking for a problem. And then my favorite, the fog. I love fog because it's the same analogy as the transition from order into chaos to the new order. I love fog. And I think Carol also, I would have talked about to you about fog. It's a state of, of being. And so these things were already happening. And that's why we got things like the Agile movement, to deal with more flexibility. But people didn't live it. One of the funniest ones I've had is you have to realize that in this new world, you have to be so suspicious of people who give you advice. If they're not living it, don't take it. So we had, we're doing a, a course, and I needed somebody to come and talk about change and Agile. And this chap turned up, and he said, I believe in Agile. I've stopped using the word project. Projects are silly things, bro. I said, well, they're just different types of change. And there's way, oh, no, no, no. We mustn't use the word project. It must be flexible. Blah, blah. You must create everything every single time. Blah, blah, blah. And not have, he gave me the whole Agile spiel. I was really impressed. And then I said, actually, your slot is 20, 20 minutes. He said, 20 minutes? It should be 30. I have two presentations. One's an hour, one's 30 minutes. I can't do it in 20. And I just burst out laughing because he lectured me on how it should be, but he wasn't living it. You see, when you hit a world like this, be really careful. As you get through the fog, there are loads of opportunities, new things you can learn, new things you can do. But if you choose the wrong ones, the damage is phenomenal. My acid test, whenever anyone advises me on anything is, do you do it yourself? And the answer is, yes, actually, I do do all of this myself. I live in a technical world. That's my future world. I run projects. Yes, that's what I do. I try in my team to have different age groups. Yes, that's what I do. I do struggle to balance them all. Yep, but I do try. So that's the metric. Don't read books. Don't listen to speakers on their own. However exciting the ideas are, in our new world, the secret is to check if they actually do it. If all they're doing is reporting what they saw in another company, be really wary. Think about it. Someone comes to your organization and they say to you, do you guys run good projects? Okay, I'm a researcher. <laughs> I'm going to publish a book <laughs> which will sell around the world. Do you guys run good projects? Do you say, no, nah, our projects are really rubbish. You know, my team, they're a bunch of jokers. No, you never do. You go, yes, we do. We run this. Look at our processes. So whenever it's a case study, I hate to say this, but it's fake news. So watch the person bringing the message. Guys, that's the second chapter done. Joe, any questions? Um, yes, uh, Eddie, there's a good one relating to that, actually, which is about how do you work with and maintain and build a team when um, they're all remote from you? Now, obviously, you're perfect for this because your entire team is remote. 
Yeah, my entire team is remote. I'll, I'll share that with you. And I, I'll uh, I'll leave that till later when I talk about my future of work because I think that would, would fit because then you can see what day my life looks like and I can I can build it in there. Are there any other comments? Or questions? Uh, so, so there's also a question about um, uh, attitudes in the workplace clearly need to change, but often the power to support these changes are at a senior level. How do we productively challenge these attitudes to implement change and take it forward? Okay, next step, I'm going to talk about people, how you get people to do change. That's really important. And then I'm also going to talk about a little bit about um, uh, how you make culture move uh, and also projects move. So I'll cover that definitely there. I would not worry so much about the senior people, especially now we're more remote. When we were in the same office, they could all see what we were doing, but now they can't. So you can always ask forgiveness rather than permission. In fact, basically what I'm saying is you de-risk it so you know it's going to succeed. Don't do stupid things. That's bad, okay? And having de-risked it so you know it's going to succeed, at that point, when you start doing it, then you start talking about it, and then the senior person can only say no, but you're halfway there already. So it's harder for them to impose the same level of control. And anyway, the control is for the order bit. It's not for the exploration through the cocoon to the other bit. So um, that's it. I, if we get a chance, I doubt we will, but I can also share with you how to become an invisible leader, so there are things like when you're doing something good, give away all the credits to everyone else. When you give away the credit, nobody stops you. Um, so, uh, but we always want the credit for ourselves. So I did that. No, no. Well, what happened was I was working with Joe and I was working with Mike and Mike and Joe really puts a lot of energy in into making it happen. And you, somebody says to Mike, Mike, what do you think? He's not going to say that was a load of rubbish because I've just praised him up. You know, so it's really important with invisible leadership to bring everyone in and it makes it easier to do the right thing rather than always coming up against that brick wall. People create change, people constrain change, people create change, people constrain change. Let me roll forward to the people, human events. Human beings um, are an illusion. And I'm going to give you an entire <laughs> three, three year course on humans in a minute and a half. Well, three minutes. Okay. Human beings, step number one total illusion. Your brain has two halves. If they're split, the left half doesn't know what their right half is. You can write with one hand. Oh, can you can you switch to the um, to the uh, my brain just stopped to the third screen? Thanks. Great. Okay. Um, so your brain has two halves. Okay. Without, yeah, great. Okay. So left brain can do stuff. You can write with your left. If it's split, it doesn't know what the other half is doing. Your heart isn't told by your brain when to beat. It has its own little brain. Your stomach doesn't get told what so it has its own little brain. There's this thing called the vagus now, which connects them all. And yet somehow you think that you are a unique human being. Why? It's total illusion. Your ego tells you a lovely story about how wonderful you are. This story is crucial because without being wonderful, when the tigers four million years ago, came out of the jungle to bite you, you don't let them eat you. So you have to say, I've got to run <clears throat> because I'm worth it, okay? So you've got to do that. So that's really crucial. But in this process of telling you a good story about yourself, your brain does other weird stuff. So if we take a human being, and I hope this doesn't look too much like Homer Simpson, it usually does. Um, the way we work is you're busy doing something, all of a sudden, somebody surprises you, just like the tiger coming out of the bush. What happens is you've got a bit of software just in your neck here. It has one job only. It just checks for change and it says, is everything the same? Yes, relax. Is everything the same? Yes, relax. The moment it notices this change, it does three things really fast. First, most important job it does is it takes your modern logical brain, switches it off. Why? Because thinking will always be too slow. Second thing it does is it makes you really, really scared. Why does it make you really, really scared? Because when you're emotionally in the moment, so something's coming to eat you, you don't go, I got to meet my tiger, but go out meeting at four. Nobody does that. You just run. Then it fills you full of adrenaline drugs. The adrenaline then engages your feeling uh, uh, brain, in other words, your body, makes all the bits work. And if you're lucky, later when you relax, <sighs> the adrenaline level comes down, maybe the fear level comes down, and you go, oh, sticks, poke, point, etc. Why am I telling you this? Because everyone around you has the same software in their minds. So if you're going to get them to move fast through change, you must avoid surprising them. You must avoid triggering that. And there's a way to do it because they have a second piece of software slightly higher up. Have you noticed how brilliant all your own ideas are? Yes, they are. Yours are brilliant. Everyone else is rubbish. Why? Because there's another piece of software, hunter-gatherer software, which basically works like this. If you have an idea, okay, it makes you fall in love with your idea. Why? So that you will act to turn it into more food. Do you understand? So 
The reason is your brain burns energy 10 times faster than muscle. We can't waste brain energy. So that's what this software does. That's why your own ideas are brilliant. So if you can help other people create the idea, co-create, collaborate, they buy in, they bring the energy, they make it happen. But if you are, oh, the big I am, it's all about me, I'm so important. Look, I want all the credit. You cannot connect with people. If you cannot connect with people, you can't collaborate with them. You can't coll collaborate with them. They will never own it. And therefore, it's always pushing against the wall. Did I explain the whole design of human beings really fast? Things to trigger people to engage. Questions are good. Laughter is good. Asking them, getting them to do stuff. All those things which make people do stuff are good. This will have happened to you, and watch out for it. It's called the ugly baby syndrome. I'll explain. You have an idea. You think it's brilliant. You rush to your team. You want to show it off. It's like your baby on your arm. Go, look at my beautiful idea. I went to the NHS Project Futures Fest. Look at that. And you describe it to them. Bad news. For them, it's a surprise. So what do they do? They look at it. Oh, shock. Their brains are off. So they look at him. They don't respond. He says, surely you can see his beautiful face. Look, he's just lovely. Look at his feet. And they go, oh, ugly baby. He goes, no, no, no. How can you be so rude about this? The latest idea. And you have that conversation. My, ugly, my baby's beautiful. Your baby's ugly. My baby's beautiful. Your baby's ugly. And then they all leave. And what happens is one person stays around and says, you know that idea you had? I thought it was quite cool. I've been thinking about the same thing myself. Can I work with you on it? What you think is that you think they like their idea, but you didn't hear. I've had the same idea myself. They like their own baby. They just want your baby milk to feed their baby. And the others who leave, who haven't bought it, they just say there's an ugly baby in there. They never change. So the design of human beings is really important. And that's the design of you. Nothing is going to be different in your world unless you drive it. I'll say it again just in case you, you, you um, didn't hear that. But nothing's going to be different in your world unless you drive it. Yeah, sure, other people can create chaos and stuff for you. But if you want it to be better for yourself, you're going to have to drive it. One of the reasons we don't is because we're scared. The fear bit is really important. So what we do in terms of trying to make sure that you can go where the fear is, that's a quote from a chap called Brian Rose. A great quote, really useful. One of the ways you can do that is two methods. One, imagine you've done it. Get all the feelings and talk about what happened. When it goes wrong, you'll feel proud that you guessed it was going to go wrong rather than upset. That's number one. That's a bit of insurance policy. Number two, brainstorm all the things you think are going to go wrong. See if there's anything you can do to fix them immediately. If you can't fix them, work out how you'll limit them in case they go wrong. Decide how you're going to keep an eye on them and then plan for plan B. This is a method called fix it now. Um, at the end of the session, I don't know whether you know, I don't know which side it's on. I've created a web page which says at the event for slash HEE. I'm going to put links to all the tools, so like the hopes and fears tool. This tool called Fix It Now is really useful because it makes you relax because you've understood what's coming your way and you've dealt with it. So that's people. They're only going to work when they collaborate. You're only going to be effective when you stop thinking about the big I am. It's about us, not just you. So the other thing we've also done this week is we've talked a little bit about things like diversity, and I'm going to pick up on that now. So uh, diversity is just a nightmare. I'll tell you my own personal story because it's funny. You know, um, basically, I've been black most of my life. Um, you may, I don't know whether you've noticed or not, but I've been black most of my life. You know, I was born in Ghana in uh, West, West Africa, and I was just Eddie. Just any, okay? And then I went to a British public school and suddenly I became black. Who knew? It was so funny. And people used to come and tell me these jokes and they were really funny. I can't repeat any of them these days, even if I can remember, because nowadays they're racist jokes. But I didn't know. I just thought they were funny. I didn't know, and they probably didn't know because they were kids, what they were about. They just copied their parents. Hilarious. Okay, so people are very different. And part of the reason is that the brain is this weird construction which which basically uh, has rules in it. Like, for example, if it learns something and it likes it, it thinks it's true because that helps your ego. If somebody says something which doesn't fit, then your brain literally has a software which is called cognitive dissonance, which wipes out what it's heard so it can continue believing what it's, it, it does. So something like racism goes all the way back to early fake news where a Dutch investor, is it Dutch or Danish? Dutch investor, I think, wanted to exploit some poor in Africa, so hired a journalist to tell stories about the dark continent and how everybody there was childlike and needed help. I mean, sorry, 13 something, I don't know. And so everyone got this fake news and they remember it and they carry it forward. This has got no connection with reality. Never take your own opinions too seriously. 
But now we're trying to move forward. There's a, a lot of work being done to involve people. Now, when I talk about Cube, you'll understand about including introverts and stuff like that. But let me just talk about why companies and why organizations and things like the NHS, sometimes senior managers don't always embrace diversity. And there's a reason here. They know this, and you know this, which is, you have a bunch of mates. You, you used to go out together, if you can remember those good days. And then one of your mates says, I'm going to bring along my other half. Okay, And you're all grown in with, why? Because when you're together as mates, it's like magic. You spark off each other. It's brilliant. Okay? When their friend comes along, you have to say, would you like to have a cup of tea? It's just so dreadful. Okay? So we all know that if you have a group, maybe I'll do it a bit lower down. If you have a group of people and they're performing quite well, great super team. Okay, if you add a new person who doesn't fit, doesn't know what the culture is, doesn't know the rules, the performance goes down. And everyone knows this. So when you say diversity is good, people go, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, because they know that the performance is going to go down, it's going to, everything's going to take longer. Okay, now if you add another person, say, we'll make it more diverse, it continues going down. And one of two things happens as this slide continues. The first thing which can happen is that people go, rrr, rrr. so you've got a team of 10 people, you keep replacing them with different people, so now you've got three of the original group, the seven of the original group, of the new group, the three just keep working the same way, they ignore the seven, performance is rubbish, doomed, everything's bad, life is horrible. But if you're lucky at this point here, somebody rewrites the ground rules. You remember when we did the hopes and fears, and I said, what are your fears? How are we going to fix them? Those are setting ground rules. Let's say people say, okay, right, now everyone should get a chance to talk. We should write before we talk so everyone gets to contribute so we can see what's done and the introverts come join in. Maybe this is a new set of ground rules. Well, when they set the ground rules which cover everyone, then you get this whoosh. This is what we call a J-curve. A J-curve is what you want from diversity because diversity comes up here. But the only way you get a J-curve is to understand how to manage that rebuild. So just talking about diversity, diversity is good. Diversity, people don't believe it, but they won't say it because, hey, you know, you can't say that in public. Okay, so always look at your team. Check the ground rules. Make sure you're involving everyone. So that's what I'm going to say about people. I'm going to do a little bit about projects, and then we're going to have a little bit of a break. So let me just help you with a, the bit about projects. So um, I think I drew already for you this idea of different types of projects, is that right? Uh, duh, duh, duh. I had over here the ones with the what and the how, which I call paint by numbers. I had the foggy ones here. I had the questy ones here. I had the movie ones here. Do you remember from the other diagram? Okay. Well, there's another couple of dimensions which are worth noting. If you're doing stuff and it's easy to see, like, for example, you're building a building, it's very visible, then they're much easier. If you're doing something like culture change and software or something like that, it's really hard to see progress, so it's hard to keep motivation. So if you're doing something invisible, as a leader, you have to tell the story of what's going on because people can't see it. Really, really crucial. So you ask yourself, am I painting my numbers on a quest, the four or movie? Is it visible or invisible? That's the thing. And then the last dimension is who wants this change? If you are doing the change to yourself, it's called a change program. If you're doing the change because someone's asked you or you're doing it for someone else, it's called an external program. External ones are really easy. There's a contract. There's a scope. Nobody cheats. There's no politics. Change programs. <laughs> Have you lived those? <laughs> okay. So as a leader, if it's a change program, you really need to engage people. So the rule is go slow to go fast. Communicate to engage, not to inform. Go slow to go fast. Always work through the ground rules. Remember, I started with the hopes and fears. I was even started talking slightly slower at the start. I was asking you what your thoughts are. Do you agree? I'm trying to engage with you as we go along, okay? And from this, you can literally almost predict everything that's going to happen in a project. Imagine the project is paid by numbers, and it's very visual, visible. And it's an external project with a clear scope. How are you feeling in your gut? Hey, okay? Imagine it's a quest. <coughs> We're going to eliminate COVID. We're going to get everyone injected. How are you feeling? It's very visible. We can see the number of people we're chatting. You mean? Great. Imagine it's a movie. Hey, we've got a new platform. We're going to run our PO more like this. Da, da, da. You want to use your skills. How are you feeling? You're feeling confident. You want to listen to people. Okay. Projects of fog. <laughs> don't know what we're doing. Don't know how to do it. Something must be done. Everyone's on top of us. Can't see progress. Totally invisible. And it's internal. <laughs> Good luck. Try the meditation. 
Okay, so that's what I wanted to share about projects. The only other uh, element about projects, which is interesting, I think, is the idea that actually we know exactly how to deal with them. Again, remember I commented that simple solutions and complex situations really crucial. So let me share with you a different screen. This is my summary <laughs> of, um, of, of projects and what goes wrong. So <laughs> another one of these bubble diagrams, sorry about that. Starts up here. Cost too much, took too long, doesn't bloody work. Team are pissed off, uh, lost business, unhappy sponsor. These things go wrong all the time, like 70 to 90% of the time on projects. Do you agree? I'm sure the poll has launched. Okay, why does it happen? Oh my God, we're running late. Why, we have to redo everything. You're kidding me, why do you have to redo everything? Well, we haven't evaluated the risk. Well, why didn't you have a decent planning method or coordination? If you don't have planning manage, uh, risk management coordination, bad stuff's gonna happen to you. Oh my goodness, we're running, having to redo the tasks because uh, again, why? Because we didn't meet the client's requirements. You're kidding me, why didn't we meet the? Because well, they changed their goals or actually we couldn't catch up and change their plans, our plans. Why is that we didn't review the goals? Why didn't you review the course? Because we never knew what the client wanted in the first place. Why is that? Because we have rubbish learning and review skills. So what I'm trying to do is work you down to these four. These come up over and over and over again. You've got to do something about your planning, your risk management, and your coordination. Figure out how to do those. Good stuff happens to you. Engaging human beings. We call it stakeholder management. That's a good one. Learning, reviewing, seeing where you are. Crucial. Leading, so actually getting people to follow you and building a team. We're going to talk about remote teams in a second. Crucial. So when we are busy thinking about um, our world of projects, what I usually do is I just think about that and then I go, right, okay, so what do we actually need to know? And all we really need to know is how are we doing on stakeholders? And all the, there's a lot of tools and methods about stakeholders, but all you have to say is, Am I really bringing all the people who are affected by this along with me? The ones, I call them stakeholders, because the original idea started with a chap called Colin Hastings, early 90s, uh, and Wendy Brenner. And uh, they, they had the vision of a stakeholder. And we joked about it when I was a junior researcher at Ashridge. And the idea was, and I was the researcher putting the stuff on, that you know, people are stakeholders because like Dracula, they're the ones who hold the stake ready to drive it through your heart. That's one way they're stakeholders. Second way they're stakeholders, is that they're holding like a wooden foot fence post, the stake for you to hit so their fingers are at risk. And the third way they might be stakeholders, they're actually outside and they bet on you. They've got financial stakes. They say, yes, that project will work. No, it wouldn't. So stakeholders, you've got to find them. You've got to manage them. You as a leader, you have to think about your leadership. If it's foggy, imagine, foggy project. No one knows what's doing. I come in, I go, right, guys, this is what we're going to do. Uh, very directional. Are you going to follow me? Of course not. But if I come in, and I'm open, and I build trust. Remember, you will never follow anyone through the fog you don't trust. Let me tell you how you build trust. I'm going to teach you something. You have to basically put your hand on your heart and swear never to use it for evil. Otherwise, I can't teach you. Go on, go on, I can see you. Hand on heart, not going to use this for evil. Okay, so to build trust fast, old days, work alongside somebody for 25 years, result. Not possible. We're all remote, new teams all the time. So works like this. Step one, promise to do something. Step two, do it. Do you know what step three is? Remind the person you promised you were going to do it and you did it. Do you know what step four is? Repeat with something else. Promise again. How many times do you have to go around that loop before they trust you? Four. And once they start to trust, you must never break the loop. So for example, if I meet a new client, I'll say, I'll send you the, the, the notes of this meeting straight after this. I know I will because I was taking the notes. Are you with me? So I send them the notes. I send them a note saying, did you get that? I said I'd send it. And they go, yes. And then I find three or four other things. And once we start to trust each other, we can then move together through the fog without them distrusting me. So I can actually be useful to them. Otherwise, they always try to double guess me because you know how life is. Okay. So leadership must match the type of change. So there's lots of stuff about leaders, leader followers, uh, servant leadership. All you need to do is say, what type of change? What would my followers be expecting from me? It's a quest. Can you imagine if King Arthur on his quest was a boring old fart? Nobody would have gone. He was exciting and time. He jumped on the table and said, we must seek this grail. You know, yeah. Okay, great. So leadership is important. And then we move on to um, the whole point of learning and review. Um, again, the more frequently you learn, the better. Remember, don't take your own opinions too seriously. Whatever you thought is probably wrong. <laughs> okay. And then finally, we're into planning coordination. When you're planning in the fog, there's a technique called sticky steps. It'll be on our site. 
It's how you plan when you don't know what you're going to do. So guys, I'm going to stop at that point. If I've done a good job, I've set the structure of the universe. If I've done a good job, I've gone past through into back to BC. If I've done a good job, I've looked at people, the design of people, how to engage them. And I've also highlighted projects and tried to make it as simple as possible for you with as little jargon as possible, even in terms of methodologies and so on. It's really something about creating things and it's not complicated, but we're all academics and consultants. So we make up more and more new words to make it really complex as well. Joe, can I stop there? Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Eddie. Um, and uh, just keeping up, I think, is the biggest challenge uh, at the moment. So that's a, a fantastic wealth of thoughts, ideas and insights. Um, so uh, we're going to give, move out into the breakout areas now. And it's your chance. Can we keep the breakout really short, Joe, because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. So can OK, we... now that means everybody's got to be really prompt about this. Five, so... Five minute breakout. Go talk, listen, stick your things in chat, come back. Then we've got our last 20 minutes together. OK, does everybody hear that? Go, so go, 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 go. go now. The world of change. Into the session. <laughs> we'll off. give you a countdown. Hi, everyone. Joe, did they come up with anything interesting? <laughs> well, I think we need to, to give them a moment to get their uh, comments uh, in the chat um, so that we can see what they had to say about it. Brilliant. Um, but I, I think given the chats we were having before, there's going to be some, uh, some, some really lively comments. Uh, we, had, uh, we had some really, really, everybody was thought it's, it's been so much fun. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, just starting to come through now. Uh, so our group concluded that our biggest surprise uh, uh, from uh, the, the, so the TAL was uh, that it's quite sim simple, really. It's yeah. all about people. I think we had expected something more about systems, etc., and the technology. The, the human beings come first, always, always, always. Um, I mean, again, you know, if you, think, if you put technology first, you're doomed because it'll enslave you. We're more flexible than the software. You know, so we'll always end up doing what the software was. You've got to click here. So we click there. It's not the software moving to where we are. So human beings first. Human beings also important because you're trying to fulfill their dreams and yours, but also because they're the only things that can really stop you. <laughs> Great. Anything else, Joe, I need to pick up um, on? So, so yeah, I, I think a number of teams reflected on that about actually the focus is people, uh, that, that, that that's really what it's about. But Robert's put, uh, I feel like I've been hit by an eddy tsunami and it was just, <laughs> I just need some time to reflect. <laughs> yeah, so the, the tsunami, is, I wanted to give you like the big picture, but the really important thing is remember the nature, the structure of the universe. We go from order through the horrible foggy bit with the spiky things into potentially new order with the dragon and the gold. So if what I'm saying is making you reel back and think, oh, God, I've got to think about that, that's a good sign. If you're going, I knew all that already, that I've totally failed, because really you've got to do caterpillar, caterpillar. What's this thing flying above me? Oh, oh, okay. You've got to learn to be the butterfly. You can't get there straight away. So it's a journey. Read other things, watch other things, just to try and stimulate you to, towards uh, being able to do that. Joe, want one more maybe? Um, so uh, there's also a comment about uh, building trust uh, and, uh, you know, how important it is and, and really bringing that to people's consciousness about that cr constructively creating that trust through that four step process. Correct. I mean, at some stage, I mean, I've said to you things like I'll cover this and then I've covered it. And I said, there you go. And I've, I've said it's about making sure that we go through the journey. I'll, I'll, I'll re reiterate that I reiterate. So I'm actually using it in this presentation. We probably haven't noticed. <laughs> Great, let's roll forward. So I want to share with you one of my favorite uh, videos. I hope it plays beautifully. Uh, this is one of my friends. Uh, she runs um, the tourism for um, the Faroe Islands. Um, let's hope the sound is loud enough. Now that we don't have any tourists in the Faroe Islands, we have a lot of extra time on our hands. So we thought that we would give those few who couldn't visit as planned and everyone else a chance to visit the Faroe Islands through us. We will be fitted with a camera and give everyone access to control us using their mobile phone. When you press forward, we move forward. When you press left, we turn left. And when you press jump, well, we jump. <laughs> Each trip will begin in a new location. And as a virtual tourist, you can ride, sail, 
and they will control a helicopter. So you can literally sit at home and control a helicopter in the Faroe Islands. Where we end up is up to you, as long as you keep us out of harm's way. You can take a free virtual trip at visitfaroeislands.com or follow our adventures on Facebook and Instagram Live. In the meantime, we look forward to welcoming you back to the Faroe Islands in real life. Now that we don't have any tourists in the Faroe Islands... Great. Okay. So that, that video really was there to try and show that with digital, you can actually expand your world and connect with other people. That's a really innovative solution to, uh, to COVID. Um, really interesting. What's, what's fascinating also is um, that having done that, they then decided they want the tourists back, which is interesting, but we'll move on to that one. So my life basically is about controlling someone else at a distance, but it's not actually a, a someone else. It's actually... Um, I guess the best way to describe it is a version of me. It's called an avatar, or in my case, we call it a cubot. So I'm going to give you a day in my life. And in doing that, I'll answer some of the questions about how life should work and stuff like that. So here we go. So this is my desk. I have three screens on my desk. I can show you afterwards with a camera. Uh, screen on the left is where I'm actually presenting from today. Uh, let me go back, actually. Screen on the left is where I'm presenting from today. The one in the middle is where I'm watching 20-second delay. And then one on the left is usually where my data is. So when I get in in the morning, actually, I'm going to do it this way around. Let me, um, uh, how do you make plus? And you guys probably know technology. Plus? There you go. That's better. Let me do that way. Then I can control it better. Yeah. So um, when I get in in the morning, you know how in the old days, when you go in the morning, you'd go and say hello to everyone? Well, because I'm connecting with everyone electronically, I literally can see everyone on cube. And often I'll go in, and uh, Joe would have had this experience, so I just say, hello. You know, I go in and just say hi to people, because you can say hi to everyone. Remember, the human beings come first. In the transformation we're making to this new world, it's not about the technology. We're making three transformations. One is uh, a workforce, workplace um, transformation, which we've understood. But there's a cultural transformation. We want to engage people. We want to let them work in a diverse fashion. We want to change how they interact. One of the key things with collaboration is building that relationship and keeping talking. If you only meet somebody once a year, you're always formal. If you're chatting with them, hey, how, how's the dog? And so on. Easy. Everything is easy. So I'll say hello to most people early in the morning. And having understood who, where everyone is, this is the cube lobby. I usually go to my office. So it says my cubicle, Eddie Obeng. I don't know if you can see that or not, but basically that's my office I would go into. All the other ones listed here are other rooms on Cube, but in Pentacle. Pentacle's our organization. Every company has a campus, so only people in my organization come here. For example, HEE has its own campus, and only HEE people can go there, So um, unless they're invited. So this is where I come. I go to my office. It's quite a nice office. You can see on this office, I've got two screens, not three, because <laughs> I couldn't afford the third one being virtual. Uh, I've got a nice, comfy green chair over there. On the left screen, I think I'm running... Uh, no, right screen is LinkedIn, and on the left screen, I can't work out what I'm working on there. But that's just like you probably do in real life. Uh, can't, still can't read it. Um, and then what I've done, I'm doing here is I know I've got a meeting with someone, so I've pulled up the box which tells me all the cubicles I can go to, and then I, I'm going to jump to one of them, and cube takes a few seconds usually to download stuff, and as long as the internet's behaving itself, everything is good. Um, so so you, you jump across to the other one, and this one is the core team meeting. You're asking, how do we work as a team? So one of the ways we've built our team is every morning we have coffee together at um, 10 o'clock, and that suits both people in this hemisphere and our, our, the, the people who work with us in uh, Australia and, uh, and in India. So we have it's coffee uh, in the morning. But it doesn't have to be coffee. You just bring your own drink. And we have this thing called a simultaneous sip where we go, okay, right, time for a simultaneous sip. And we go, red, two, three, go. So we actually literally have coffee together. Uh, and then we start the day and we have a conversation. In the middle here where it says September 2020, this is um, a list of all the things which are happening for the whole team, September 2020. So they are, I might look at them. I'm going to browse it to see what's on there. So I'm browsing it. I'm looking at all the projects we're working on and I can go in and dig deeper to understand. So this is me um, looking at um, the same lobby, cube lobby, but on the middle screen. Why? Because I'm supposed to be meeting somebody for a different, in, in uh, Fusion, can you see Fusion up here at the top, for a different presentation because we're putting together a conference. 
So I'm going not to my office, uh, but I'm going to my office in the Fusion campus. Slightly different. You can see I've got nice windows because clients are coming there and no big chair. I've got a comfy chair for the clients instead. It's just another room. And we're discussing what we're going to do. I think this was me telling her that COVID was like the emperor telling, uh, the boy telling the emperor he had no clothes because <laughs> COVID suddenly made us discover we could work digitally. Um, and then this is me in another place just working on something called five Ps. It's a way in which we set out the purpose principles so that we align, same trick as hopes and fears, getting people to invent, getting them to line up together. This is what we call performance enhancement tool. You've seen the hopes and fears one. We've got about 300 of them embedded on Cube so people can easily work together. So when you talk about bringing a team together, rather than thinking about the team build, get them focused on doing something. And if you've got a nice template like this, once they've done it, they're aligned. You don't have to do a team build. And also, because you're not looking at each other, we're looking at the document, you, introverts are happy, extroverts are happy. Cube culture says we write first and we talk, so everybody's involved. When we come to talk, we do this thing called spin casting, so everyone gets a chance to talk so that the noisy ones don't take all the oxygen and the quieter ones can come in. Because we've written before we talk, we cover all the cultures as well. And we're talking about here to them. This is how things are. This is where we want them to get to. So it's another tool for us to use. So I'm talking to the client about that. Um, and then I'm back to my team. So this is me. This is David Wainwright. This is Josh, the two of the people in Pentacle. And we're meeting for coffee. So we're doing a catch-up. A catch-up, a letter say, on the left, what we're going to celebrate and what we're going to be doing for the day. <coughs> so there's plenty of conversation, lots of laughter. Honestly, if you're using a digital technology and you don't get laughter, get rid of it. It's the wrong technology. So many technologies were invented in the old world. So somebody has to let you in and so on. Uh, there's no laughter. Everyone's on mute. We're never on mute on cue. This is me. You can see I have two headsets. I have my big headset. I have my small headset because I'm in two places. <laughs> so I'm having two conversations most of the time anyway as well. Um, and so now I'm going to, to go meet another client somewhere called Cube Discovery, which is where we introduce people to Cube. Uh, I'm just changing my name so that they know it's me because I might not be leveled in there. And I'm going to take them. Oops, that's about it. Ah, there you go. Oh, well, you are, look, this is why I'm teaching you. There you go. You're not the first. Ha! <laughs> so that's the sort of thing which we'll be doing on a drawing board uh, into another cubicle. This is a conference we're running. We, we've got different speakers here. Um, Steve Wake, who does lots of benefit stuff, which you were talking about earlier on Monday. Um, and then we, we've got um, a big conference room. I'm meeting somebody, we're talking. And then lunch. Lunch, try not to have too many carbs. Always better for the energy. Uh, and, then, and then some more work. And I'll just skip through. Oh, that's me pulling a face. And then I also tend to do wakes sometime during the, 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 the day. Some things get you out of breath. Remember I told you? Uh, and then... Often we have tea at three o'clock and we tend to have it out of doors in the cafe. You know, in, I live in the UK, no blue skies in the UK, but the sky is always blue on cube. When you're building virtual teams, the only important things to do are to make sure that you don't upset people. So a quick question. Imagine you got an email and the email looked a little bit like this. Okay, so let's go for this email. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, so you get an email which looks like this. As the person building the team, which one, what do you not, what do you not say? <laughs> what you don't say is that's wrong. It's easy to break relationships digitally. It's very difficult to fix them. So what you do is you always try and build on it. You say, uh, what you've done is really great. I'm glad you did it. Here's the issue. Then you provide some data. The other two were great. How should I interpret the first one? Question. Issue data question. And then you shut up and they go, oh my goodness, that one's wrong. They invent it themselves. They buy into it. They fix it. There's no conflict. Relationship built. ka -ching. Issue data question built. It will also be on your Eddie Bank for slash HEE page. Really useful technique. So, Joe, I'm going to start at that point. If I've done a good job, I've explained the context of future of work and what it means for us. I've done a really good job. I've tried to simplify all the noise out there to try to get you to realize there are some five normal structures which govern all our lives. If I've done a really good job, I've also helped you understand people, how to engage them, the software, the stories we tell ourselves, and how to bring them along and collaborate with them 
and help them invent the solution. And I've also done a good job. I've helped you understand that projects are quite simple. There's just four types. You can have different methodologies. So Fog works well with Agile. You know, rapid prototyping works well with Quest. If you do things like the deep dive hackathon, which you might be doing, the ideal methodology is a Quest. Ideal, one of my clients, I taught them that they use that in that video. Um, if it's paint by numbers, waterfall works best, and so on. So if I've done a good job, I've explained to you that the project type determines how you want manage it, but it also says how you lead, how you engage your stakeholders, when you should review, and everything else. It's really straightforward. And then I've tried from there to try and build an idea of, well, what do you do and what do I do? So I'm going to stop there. And Joe, final questions, comments, summaries? Did I pass? <laughs> uh, you, you've done phenomenally. There's been some great comments and, and it's, uh, people really fascinated by um, seeing how you've worked and also uh, Cube. And there's a lot of interest in a follow up on that and people wanting to experience it. And of course, some of my teams also um, in the call and uh, also somebody from the Deloitte session is in uh, and talking about how they enjoyed the experience as well. So what we'll do is we'll arrange a follow up session with everybody that's interested in exploring it a bit more and um, and in getting to experience it properly because it's not the same unless you're in there. Yeah, exactly. So, so come and experience this experience. It's not software. You do a no. meeting, not a demo. So tomorrow you're with Anthony Willoughby drawing maps. When you do that together, think about the map you're drawing. It's not just the map of how life is now. You also have to move, have in your map, the move through the chaos and the uh, sparky bits and also try and draw in the map the value, where the gold is, where the dragon is, and where you want to take the NHS or HEE. But remember, as I said at the beginning, uh, so in the middle, um, people you take advice from are doing what they're saying. So as you draw your map, prepare yourself, whether you're an HEE or wider NHS, to live what you're talking about, not just to talk about it. Thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. That's been fantastic. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Very much. Enjoy the rest of the week. Yeah, um, that's great. So, so bringing up the uh, next session, which is going to be all about equality and diversity. It's a really important thing to follow on from this, which is all about being human and it's all about focusing on people. So take the learning from this session, take it to the next one. How do we, how do we make that future people centered? Great. Thank you very much, Eddie. That's been Thank fantastic. And that's the web, that's the web link on there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Right. I'll have it live in an hour. Okay, bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, we'll share all the resources from this and we'll do a follow-up with everybody. So thank you so much for joining. Everybody's had a wonderful time. Good. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for being, being my foil and asking me difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Remind me about what, sorry? Oh, sorry. Yes, we've got the game codes. And, and sorry, Eddie, this is this has become a really competitive thing. Um, so so we, we didn't get the right code up at the start and there was a mutiny. <laughs> um, so um, uh, so they're going to come up, both of them at the end, so that everybody's got the codes. They know, don't know what the prizes are yet, but they're fiercely competing for them. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. And we'll put those up now and close the session. Thank you, Eddie. That's been uh, amazing as always. All right, thanks. Thanks for